And then we're just going to take a minute to go live um, on Facebook as well. Um, and everyone's good with this being recorded for Facebook and YouTube. It occurred to me I should ask. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, and it looks like we are live. Oh, great. Okay. Um, all right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Um, this is Berkeley Public Library, and this is Popping the Science Bubble, um, a monthly science lecture. Uh, we're happy to bring back Berkeley Pub or bring back Popping the Science Bubble in the new year. Um, generally, we take December off. So it's been a while since I've seen um, you all, and it's just great to have everyone uh, back this evening. Um, so welcome to Popping the Science Bubble. Um, this is a monthly seminar series um, that aims to, to share new research findings from grad students and postdocs at UC Berkeley with the general public and create constructive discussion about a variety of science topics. Uh, we are so excited at Berkeley Public Library to have this partnership. Uh, we've been working with Popping the Science Bubble folks for years, and this is just a great program that we just love hosting. We have two speakers at each seminar who will talk about their current research or a topic that they find really interesting. The organizers are three graduate students at UC Berkeley, Jenna, Madison, and Oksana. If you're interested in checking out their past seminars, you can visit their website, check out their Twitter or Facebook, and sign up for the listserv in order to keep in the loop for upcoming seminars. Our speakers um, also can sometimes share interesting additional resources if you want to learn any more about the topics discussed today on the website. And all of these seminars are archived on Popping the Science Bubbles YouTube page. So I recommend if you want to rewatch this video or share it with someone else or just look at some of the past um, seminars, check out their YouTube page. All right, I'm going to have Oksana take it away and introduce tonight's program. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, before we start the presentations, I just want to remind you that you can ask questions during the course of the talk using the Zoom Q&A box or the chat or in the comments on Facebook. And if you're interested in learning more about popping the science bubble or checking out our past seminars, uh, you can visit our website and social media and stay connected with us through our listserv. Our first speaker today is Kirsten, who's a PhD candidate in the Integrative Biology Department at UC Berkeley. She studies how bacteria exchange genes with insects, which give the insects unique superpowers. She grew up in Miami, Florida, and loves salsa dancing. Uh, we're very excited for your talk, Kristen. Please take it away. Hi, guys. Um, I'm gonna, oh, I need to share the slide first. <laughs> One second. Right on the current slide, and then presenter view. All right, um, can you see it? Cool. All right, hi. Um, thank you for coming to my talk. Um, I'm talking today about sharing is caring, um, and how gene exchange from viruses or bacteria to insects can lead to protection from predators. And this image I have over here is just showing like how there are lots of different animals that can be exchanging genetic information between each other. Um, and I think that when we usually think of molecular inheritance or like the passing down of DNA, usually you're gonna think about um, your parents passing down your genetic information to you or to their children. And I like to show my mom and my dad and they combine their DNA and then that led to me. Um, but the kind of DNA transfer, the type of like inheritance of DNA that I study is gonna be um, horizontal inheritance. So this one where the parents pass down the genes to the children, that's called a vertical inheritance. So it's going down from your parents to you. But what I study is a little bit different. And the example I like to use, like it's horizontal, um, is me. Uh, but I'm from Florida. So I like to talk about this like kind of made up example with alligators. And I like to imagine what would happen if an alligator exchanged its DNA with, with me, right? Um, and there's a lot of different genes that make up an alligator, but I like to imagine like maybe 
the DNA that leads like the scaly skin or like the sharp teeth would get inherited. And that's called horizontal inheritance. Instead of passing down genes from like your parents to your children, parents to children, this is like exchanging DNA between different species. And the truth is that this is not that far-fetched. And there's a lot of examples in the past 10 years that we've seen. There are lots and lots of examples of horizontal gene transfer leading to really interesting phenotypes and different like unique characteristics in animals. And the thing I like about it is it's kind of like inheriting superpowers from like a really unexpected source. And um, some of the examples that I think are the, the coolest, uh, ladybugs actually have horizontal gene transfer where they inherited DNA from bacteria. Because the thing is that bacteria actually fight and live in an ecosystem with other bacteria. They inherited DNA from bacteria that helped them fight other bacteria. There is um, these, uh, there are these different, it's a, this is actually a caterpillar. They also inherited uh, DNA, like antibacterial DNA from bacteria. I know there's a lot of antibacterial examples. That's because like that's one of the most common, the most common types of horizontal gene transfer. And then the example I think is like the absolute coolest is when it comes to ticks. It's the tick over here. And ticks inherited, so you know how ticks like can suck on your blood and your blood won't, uh, it won't coagulate. Usually you have this coagulation response where your blood will start thickening. Um, ticks actually inherited the horizontally acquired DNA um, from bacteria that is an anticoagulant. So part of the reason that they can suck blood so effectively without that normal coagulation process is because of horizontal gene transfer. And the way that you detect horizontal gene transfer, I think is very dramatic. It's a it's conflict, um, but it's a very specific type of conflict. It's called phylogenetic conflict. And usually when you see like evolutionary biologists like myself doing any sort of research, you're gonna be looking at evolutionary trees or what we call phylogenies. And what we look at is conflict between phylogenies. And what I wanna show you is two types of phylogenies and how differences in these can tell you horizontal gene transfer is happening. So the kind of tree that most people are familiar with are gonna be species trees um, or like basically just normal ancestral patterns. And if you've ever done like, you know, a look at your ancestry, you see that your mom, you know, you're closely related to your sibling and your mother and, you know, you're less closely related to your cousins. And it's gonna be the same thing uh, when it comes to a species tree. Where if you have, let me see if I can do a little, if, hold on, laser pointer, there we go. Like if you have two, um, two tips on this tree that are more closely related, it means that the species are more closely related. Also, this should say chimpanzee, but didn't copy paste properly. Um, so you have humans that are more closely related to chimpanzees and either is to a capuchin, and you, those are more related to each other than a mouse and a gecko, for example. This is the species tree, and this is showing relationships between different species. But the thing is that this isn't the only kind of phylogeny that scientists look at. There's another kind of tree that we look at, which is going to be called a gene tree. So I think I can't turn off the pointer to go to the next slide. And a gene tree isn't necessarily always going to look the same as a species tree. So, um, if you've ever, so for example, two things that uh, bats and dolphins have in common, even though they're very distantly related, is going to be the fact that they have echolocation, right? Um, so when you look at a specific gene that's involved in the echolocative process, which is called Preston, you see that dolphins are actually more closely related to bats at this one specific gene. And that's because of convergence. It's not because of horizontal gene transfer. But when you look at something like this, this shows you a very different relationship than what you would expect in a species tree. Um, and so that, this was one example, and this in and of itself isn't horizontal gene transfer. Um, this is something else, but that is an example of phylogenetic conflict. And then when we're comparing one example that would be horizontal gene transfer, um, this is very, this tree I'm showing is very, very similar to the other one, except for the fact that you have a gecko, uh, that you have a gecko tip very closely related to a human tip over here. And if, when I look at something like this, usually the very first thought that people have when we're looking at trees like this is, oh, maybe it's some kind of contamination. Maybe some human DNA got trapped in the lizard sample, which makes sense, right? Because humans catch lizards. 
or maybe some lizard DNA got trapped in like the human sample. Who knows? But once you've done all of those, like those QC metrics and like really made sure that it's not contamination, um, if we know that this is real, what this might tell you, or this might suggest is at some point geckos inherited or geckos might have donated some of their DNA to humans. And something like this is a clear example of phylogenetic conflict, because in this case, you don't have a very clear like one-on-one -on -one pattern of the gene tree to the species tree. And obviously this was like a very simplistic example, um, a tree that I've been looking at the past, like, wait, the past few months. Hold on, okay. Yeah, and this is an example of one of the trees I've been looking at, where it, realistically it's gonna have a lot more tips, it's gonna be a lot more confusing and sort of intercalated and it's hard to make sense of anything, but this is like what a real tree would look like. And I gave you all those really cool examples of horizontal gene transfer. And I work in a lab where we study this one fly species, it's called Scaptomyza flava. And because of all these really cool examples, we were like, oh, maybe we should just do a test like of the genome, looking at all the genetic information inside this fly. And we should see whether or not there's horizontal gene transfer here, right? And a lot of gene transfer events are actually related to leaf eating and like, you know, being able to feed on plants. So we were sort of expecting something like that, but um, we ended up finding only one horizontal gene transfer event, which is for this gene called cytolethal descending toxin B or CDTB. And when we look at the CDTB gene tree, um, we see a lot of phylogenetic conflict. So over here, like this tree, I wanna show you what all the animals are in a second, because you might not, you wouldn't know what they are necessarily without the annotations. We have uh, like this clade, uh, laser pointer, um, we have this plate of insects, of like flies, a little plate of aphids, of a little group of aphids, and some other flies, and some more flies, a bunch of flies. And they're closely related. Um, they're closely related to this other group. This batch of insects is closely related to this other group um, up here, which is of um, viruses and bacteria. So you have this bacterial group most closely related to this giant group of insects. When we know that in real life, insects are more closely related to other insects than they are to bacteria, right? Bacteria are closely related to other bacteria. Um, so that's phylogenetic conflict, like, like right in the face. But the thing that's really interesting about this little batch of, um, let me point that again, this batch of um, bacterial and virus sequences is that they, are co-associated or they're associated with a bunch um, with aphids. So they live inside aphids. And I'm gonna zoom into this image and just tell you a little bit about aphids and why this is kind of interesting. So this is an aphid that's getting pulverized by a thing called a parasitoid wasp. So you see the aphids just chilling and then it's getting attacked by a wasp. And so this wasp wouldn't be able to hurt like any of us because like the stinger isn't uh, strong enough to kind of go through human skin. But that stinger, what it's doing when it actually like kind of attacks the aphid is that it's laying an egg inside it. And what happens is that egg hatches inside the aphid body. And then the little baby like grub wasp starts eating it alive from the inside, um, which is just a fact of life that aphids need to contend with. Um, but they're not, aphids aren't entirely defenseless when it comes to these parasitoid wasp attacks. So interestingly, sometimes they have these bacterial, these like bacterial friends that live inside them that actually contain CDTB, which is the horizontally transferred gene I discovered in this fly. So with the aphid does not have CDTB, um, what happens is that, you know, you get the, the wasp attacks the aphid and then lays a little baby wasp inside the aphid. And then all of a sudden you have a zombie aphid and the wasp comes out alive. And it's like, you know, sorry, RIP, RIP aphid. But when the aphids have these, um, have these like, have these like, back, they're called bacterial endosymbionts. When they have, when they're hosting these bacteria that happen to have CDTB, you see something very different. So the aphid they, it has a bacteria and has a virus and they contain CDTB. The wasp lays an egg inside the aphid and then the aphid messes up the wasp and then you have a happy aphid coming out. Um, so the wasp doesn't survive. 
And that seems to be because of the presence of CBTB, which is pretty startling. And the reason that I bring that up in the first place, this isn't just like a cute little, um, like a cute little example that I'm giving, but this is very, very closely, this is very important to Drosophila biology, because I showed you that, or fruit fly biology, because I showed you that there's a bunch of different fly species that do have CDTB. And flies are also a group that are very, very parasitized um, by a parasitoid wasp. It's a really important part of the evolutionary arms race. It's an important part of like the, uh, the fruit fly immune system. And I just think this is like the dovest picture ever. Um, I think it's really dramatic and it's um, a parasitoid wasp, like, you know, injecting its stinger into this really cool graphic image of a baby, of a baby fly, which they call, call larvae or they're called grubs or maggots or whatever you call them. Um, and this, I think this is a pretty cool video of, it's of like you actually seeing it in real time, what it looks like, where it's, uh, what they usually do is like, they kind of just like feel the ground and then like they're feeling with their stingers and then you see like that's like that's the motion it's making as it's laying the egg inside uh, inside the baby fly. So, but the thing is, I mentioned before, a bunch of the different fly species have CDTB, but one of them, or one of these flies, in general, they're like one of these flies is like very notable in the fact that it is so super hyper resistant to wasps. Um, the rest we don't actually have as much data about, interestingly enough. But that fly that I was referring to, it has CDTB, but it has only, it has basically 100% survival against wasps. And I'm saying that not because, not because like there are examples of them not surviving against wasp attack, but because, you know, you just don't want to say 100% actually. But in the entire like four years that I've had these slides, they've never, they've never died with wasps or they've never like not survived. You've never, you've never had wasps coming out of the husk. It's always been the and like this fly coming out versus like this on um, this it's like very well known model species called Drosophila melanogaster or the fruit fly which everyone knows and loves and it's like the model lab system but they don't have CDTB and when they get attacked by wasps their survival is about twenty percent they really do super poorly um, so in that sense uh, Drosophila ananasae which has this horizontally transferred gene is kind of like a super fly right and um, what I'm invested, what I've been investigating for my PhD is whether or not uh, CDTB, this horizontally transferred gene, um, is one of the reasons that this species is so effective against parasitoid wasp attack. Um, and the way that I'm doing that is using CRISPR-Cas9, which, which is a technology many of you might have heard about, um, because Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Downer just recently won the Nobel Prize. So now I get to show her picture and be like, mm, I'm using a cool technology, awesome. Um, and the thing is that what you do, what I've been doing, uh, is I use CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR-Cas9 is a way of creating edits in genes, or actually like going into the genome and making changes and just like tinkering around to see what, what happens. So what, I, what, what I'm doing is I'm creating loss of function mutations. I'm basically creating knockout mutations where I eliminate the function of this gene CDTB. The idea being like, you know, if you want to figure out how, how it works, break it. Um, so what I'm doing is if CDTB plays a role in wasp resistance, then killing it or knocking it out should lead to reduced wasp resistance in those flies. So I get the fly and then I inject them with Cas9 and these things called guide RNAs and the fly obviously isn't very happy about that. It's not actually a fly, this is sort of um, illustrative, it's actually the egg that you inject it into, but I like to show the fly like getting surprised. Um, and one, the one image I think is kind of fun to show is like part of the process of getting this done involves changing the eye color of these flies. And I don't know if, I guess when I think about it, mostly you probably haven't seen fly eyes up close, but this is actually really cool and like super, super dope because usually fly eyes are really red. They're just red. And like over here, you can see there's like little patches of red. And this is called um, mosaicism, kind of, I don't know, like kind of like Picasso-ish, I guess. I shouldn't say that. Um, so I created these loss of function mutations in, in these flies where I knocked out CDTB. And interestingly, what we observed is when I look at this graph over here, um, first you have to have a control and the control that we have is like no parasitization where you know it could, if the flies just don't perform better then that doesn't necessarily tell you about whether or not these uh, 
phenotypes are results of the gene. It could just be like the gene causes, like messes it up in some way. You wanna make sure that you're specifically targeting wasp resistance. Um, so in this control group, when it comes to no parasitization, WT stands for wild type and LOF stands for loss of function. And we have very, basically the exact same amount of flies surviving when they're not parasitized. Um, but when these flies get targeted by these two different wasp species called Leptopelina boulardii and Leptopelina heterotoma, um, we see that there's actually a significant difference in both of these cases between uh, the wild type flies and the loss of function flies where CDTP is knocked out. And in both cases, these are significant, more so in one species than another. Um, but basically this does really, this does show that uh, CDTP uh, is, seems to play a role, or at least like one of the roles in parasitoid uh, wasp resistance, because when you knock out the gene, they're performing less well uh, than if the gene is like remains intact, like in the wild type flies. Um, and these data would not be possible um, partially through the results of a collaboration that we have um, with the Biological Research Center in, hung in Hungary with my uh, co-author, Dr. Gyungi Sinegi, and also Dr. Isfan Ando. And they've been um, doing really wonderful work uh, helping us visualize uh, the immune cells of um, and like where CDTB is localized in these cells. And I'm not gonna spend very long on these, but um, just to show you an idea. And uh, so some of the major takeaways I want to take from this is that horizontal gene transfer is all over the place, which is super interesting. Um, and every year there's like really new, just cool new examples of how um, HGT has influenced animal evolution, like every single, every single like month, there's like a really cool new study. Um, and then it's defined by phylogenetic conflict or discrepancies between a species tree and the gene tree. And uh, the main takeaway about my research is that a horizontally transferred gene called CDTB uh, was transferred to insect genomes and it protects flies from wasps. And uh, these are a bunch of my collaborators and interns and um, I'm available for questions now. Um, it looks like we have one question in the Q&A box. Um, do insects carry live bacteria? And if yes, could transfer occur when one insect ingests another? Um, that's a really interesting, uh, that's, a, that's a super interesting question because, so insects do carry live bacteria. In fact, most insects do have like bacteria that are really important for a bunch of different aspects of their physiology. Um, and theoretically, Theoretically, maybe like the answer as to whether one insect could acquire bacteria by ingesting another. I'm not certain about that because the thing is that you can only have horizontal gene transfer if the gene goes not into just like, you know, like your stomach, but into your germline. So it has to be specifically in the cells that are like in the animal's gonads. So like, you know, you could theoretically get a gene transferred into like a, like a cell in your body but you won't pass it on to your descendants unless it's specifically happening in uh, one of the sex cells. Okay. Yeah, thanks for answering that. And we have another question asking about how do you inject the flies? I think there's a picture in one of your slides about that. Oh, yeah, no, so that image that I showed was uh, was definitely sort of like a comic, a comic uh, version, but the way that we inject the flies is so we outsource it actually. So what I do is I like design the guide RNAs and like I do the bioinformatics and I uh, order stuff to figure out like what exactly we're going to be injecting into them. Um, but then we send it off to this company. What they do is they prep the flies. They get them like really nice and like like basically like they have them have sex with each other and then um, they have them like in this like little lineup where they're just like laying a bunch of eggs. So they get them really like I would just say like sexually aroused um, and they give them yeast, like a bunch of yeast paste, which um, makes them really excited. Then they go crazy that they're laying a bunch of eggs because um, they get just like really, I guess like turned on by yeast, the smell of yeast paste, like the thing that you use to make bread. Um, and then they go crazy, they lay a bunch of eggs. And then the, what the people at the place do is that they shovel all the eggs into this little, like they, they put them in a row, they arrange them with a paintbrush in a row. 
And then they have this micro injector, which is just like a really, really, really thin needle that like you have to like you have to like pull it to make it that thin in person. Because like if it moves, it'll break. It's just, you know, it's very, very precise. And then they have all these reagents and then they inject them into the egg very, very carefully, like one after another, after another, after another in a row. Because the thing is like, if you do it to one fly, it'll probably die. So when I order them, I order injections for like 240, uh, for 240 eggs. And then I hope that maybe like 2% of those will actually have the mutation. Cause often like it just won't work for whatever reason. Yeah, and I could talk more about that, but I just like, yeah, it's, it's super cool. Yeah, yeah. If people have more questions about that process, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, and another question that we have is, do humans interact with or maybe mess up this transfer system? Uh, the horizontal gene transfer system, um, I wouldn't expect so. I mean, when it comes to horizontal gene transfer, a lot of the horizontal gene transfer events that we discover are going to be ancient ones. Like the the horizontal gene transfer thing that I showed is like 21 million years old. Um, a lot of it happened in the deep past. And I really wouldn't expect, I wouldn't expect humans to be playing an important part, at least when it comes to like natural gene transfer, not like, you know, not genetic modifications that we do for purposes of, you know, like for human reasons, I wouldn't expect humans to be messing that up, honestly. Okay. And also I had a question about like the process of um, that gene tree, I guess, like how do you know what bacteria to identify in connection with the genome from the animal? Like, do you process the genome library of the animal of interest and then you like match it to this database or how does that work? Oh, so that's a really good question. Um, and I thought, like, do you mean like, how do I know what the, the bacteria are or? Yeah, I guess like, how do you know what, uh, yeah, bacteria or gene to focus on? Um, oh, <clears throat> okay. Yeah. yeah, like what gene to focus on? When you're looking for horizontal gene transfer in the first place, you really just like shove all the genes into an algorithm and the algorithm tells you whether or not the closely related group is going to be an animal or bacteria. Um, and that's, that's how you do that. And then like when, once you've found a few candidate genes then you can like really look at the gene trees and try to um, kind of observe the degree of conflict between the species tree and the gene tree. And usually a bacterial sequence in the middle of like, you know, in the, usually an animal sequence and a bunch of uh, bacterial sequences is like a very clear sign. Okay, cool, thank you. And it looks like there aren't any more questions for now, but if people do think of um, additional questions for Kirsten, um, you can still drop them into the Q&A or chat box and she can answer them um, during the next talk. Yeah, thank you for the questions, appreciate it. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Um, our second speaker is Rebecca Whitman, who is a doctoral student at UC Berkeley in our mathematics department. Uh, she's originally from Redwood City and graduated from undergrad at Wellesley College with a degree in math and music. Um, and after spending the last four years in a pretty flat terrain of Massachusetts, she's thrilled to have returned to the Bay Area uh, with proper hills and year-round hiking weather. Um, but outside of graduate school, she also mentors middle school girls in math research with the Girls Angle Math Club. Um, and does will talk to us today about her research uh, on tree networks and mathematical modeling. So thank you for being here, Rebecca, and we're excited to hear all about it. Yeah, Madison, thank you so much. Let me just share my screen. I'm really happy to have heard Kirsten's talk and that you all heard Kirsten's talk because now you have several excellent examples of tree networks species trees, gene trees to keep in mind as I go through my talk, talking about those kinds of networks and abstract. So theoretical mathematics in broad doesn't exactly use the scientific method since the way we determine truth in mathematics is by logical certainty, by proving what we can from the series of true facts all the way through to our newest conclusions, rather than by using any kind of statistical confidence, experiments or likelihood. <clears throat> 
So mathematics is driven in large part by asking questions, lots of questions, and coming up with examples. Those lead to observations, just like in the scientific method. But next comes a conjecture. What, what theory can we come up with that will explain why our observations hold? Rather than testing it, we then try to prove it. And if you can find a proof, it becomes a theorem, a major result and a branching off tool to try to prove something next. So I spend, I spend my research jumping among all of these six, and you'll see an example of this process as I go through my talk. So my research is in graph theory or network theory. And a network is a object, is a way of mapping relationships between pairs of objects. So for instance, my friend's apartment has seven, has six different rooms in it. And what I've done is I've put a dot for each room in her apartment and then drawn a line between any two rooms where there's a door or a doorway between them. So for instance, in my friend's apartment, you can go from the bathroom to the hallway, but you can't go from the bathroom to the living room directly without going through the hallway. So this network models the floor plan for her apartment. We can see that there's edges and then there's vertices, which are the individual dots. This is a relatively simple network. You can also have much more complicated networks like this network of a Twitter network coming out of a summer camp. Each vertex is a Twitter user and then the edges are denoting who's following whom on Twitter. So you can see that there are some clusters of users who are all following one another. Those are color coded. And then in the lower right corner are some users who are following only themselves. And those are isolated vertices and not really part and not really connected into the larger network. So there's also, you can draw networks for all sorts of things. Uh, airplane route plans across the country, family trees, any sort of thing that you might wanna model other floor plans. Once you start thinking about networks, you see them crop up all the time. Um, social networks at parties, you can draw a line between any two guests who know one another. Without context, we call these networks graphs. When you're just looking at the vertices and edges and don't know what real world grounding if any, it comes from. And so my research is in theoretical math. And so I'm studying these graphs without any sort of context for what the graph is doing. And here are seven examples of graphs. And so you can see that some of them, like graph two is just like a circle of vertices. Graph one has every possible edge between pairs of vertices. Graph six is the smallest with just two vertices and one edge. In graph four, we have two different components to the graph. There's a set of four vertices that are connected in a path, and then a free floating isolated vertex in the middle, where we can't get from it to the other part of the graph necessarily. I like graph seven a lot. It's what we call a star graph, where there's one vertex in the center that then connects out to every other vertex. It looks a little bit like a star, I think, which is why it's called that. So one important property for graphs is talking about when they're connected. So this is, a, this is an observation you can make, which is that six of these graphs are connected or in exactly one piece. And those are the graphs that I've highlighted in black, everybody except for graph four. And in a connected graph, there's a path from any vertex to any other vertex. If we're standing on a given vertex, we can walk through the graph to get anywhere else that we want to get to. Another type of structure that we might see in a graph is what's called a cycle. And this is a non-trivial path that starts and ends at the same vertex. So if you take a look at graph number three, if we start at the very top vertex, we can walk around the triangle and get back to where we started. So this is what's called a cycle. When I say non-trivial, that means that I'm not reusing edges and I'm not starting and stopping on my same vertex without going anywhere and calling it a cycle of one that would be really silly. So when we say non-trivial in mathematics, that means rule out all of the extra silly cases and keep the good stuff. So graph one has several cycles, but I've just highlighted one of them. And graph two, the entire thing is just a cycle. But graphs four through seven don't have any cycles at all within the graph. So graph theorists love to, love to take a look at all sorts of different properties in graphs. And these are just two of the main ones that you'll see. So one important kind of graph are trees. And when I was preparing for this talk, I was frequently using my Pacific Coast Tree Finder. So this is a book where what you do is you find a leaf from a tree and then you start answering some questions about it. 
So this is the very first page of the book. If your leaf has needles, then go to the, then go below. If it has ordinary leaves, go to page 32. Once you get there, there'll be more questions. What do the needles look like? Are they bundled together? Are they apart? I followed this all the way through with some redwood needles. That's my favorite kind of tree. And after about 20 different branching steps, it said, congratulations, you're looking at a redwood tree. It's a little more interesting if you don't quite know what kind of tree you're looking at, but it works either way. And what we can do is we can map this book like it's an entire network, going from drawing an edge between any two questions, if you can go directly from one question to the next. Then once you've drawn out that whole network, it's a little bit too big to include on one slide. You'll see that when we start at this question to begin here, we branch all the way through the network out to the very end, what are called the leaves in graph theory. And that tells you what kind of tree you have. So the network itself, the network itself of this book is a tree. That's an informal way of defining a tree. But as mathematicians, we need to give it a formal definition or we won't be able to tell for sure what we're talking about. So we'll define a tree to be a graph that's connected. So it's in exactly one part. It doesn't have two separate sections. And it's acyclic, as in it has no cycles. So we're actually defining a tree by what it doesn't have. So this is another example of a tree. We also saw lots of examples in Kirsten's talk, all of the species trees, where you can branch out to see which species are more closely related than others, and gene trees. There's also family trees, decision trees, tree identification book trees, and more. Of the graphs that we were looking at earlier, we need to rule out the graphs that have cycles. That's graphs one through three, and any graph that isn't connected, so graph four. And that leaves us with graphs five, six, and seven that are examples of trees. And you can see that those graphs are connected and acyclic and look a little bit like the tree property we were describing, where if you start at any vertex, it looks like it's branching off. There's no more complicated looping back structures that are happening in your graph. That leads us to another definition for tree that could be possible, which is we could define a tree as a graph that has a unique path between every two vertices. If we start at one vertex, there's exactly one way to get to any other vertex. For instance, in this graph, if we start at the vertex on the far left, we can get all the way to that bottom right vertex just by looping up and around, but there's no other way to do that. And you should, you should test this for yourself just quickly. Pick two vertices in this graph and see if you can find a path between them and see if, you, see if that path is unique or if there's another way to do it. And remember that we can't loop back and repeat edges. We just have to use each edge at most once. So what we'll do is we're going to make a conjecture and then prove it's true, which is why I've used the word theorem here, which is that these two definitions, these two graph properties are actually the same. These are two different ways of describing trees rather than two separate graph classes. So we'll say theorem, a graph is connected and acyclic, that's our first tree definition, if and only if there's a unique path between every pair of vertices, so our second tree definition. And once we prove this, we'll have two different tests to see if a graph is a tree. So this is really asking us to prove two different things. First, if my graph is connected and acyclic, then it meets the unique path definition. And second, if my graph is meets the unique path definition, then it has to be connected and acyclic. This is a little bit like saying that the, in a Venn diagram, the circle of connected and acyclic graphs and the circle of unique path graphs are completely overlapping. These are describing the same graphs. So let's start with the first of these statements. And we'll try to write out a proof, which is a way of expl meticulously explaining what we know to be true. So let's let G, G for graph, be a graph that's connected and acyclic. And we need to show that there's a unique path between every pair of vertices. So let's choose at random some vertices. So we'll choose V and W. And we assumed that G was connected. And the definition of connected means that there has to be at least one path between V and W. That's almost good, but we need that path to be unique. So what we'll do is prove this by contradiction. So we'll say, what if there were two different paths? That would be a really big problem. So we'll show that if we make that assumption, we have to get to a conclusion that's obviously false. So if there were two different paths, say a high road and a low road, then what we could do is we could combine those two different paths from B to W 
and form a cycle. If this is V, and this is W, we can go up and around or down and around. And together, that forms a cycle. It's possible that the cycle we would form could be smaller than the two paths if, say, they both started in the same vertices and then split. But we would definitely have to have a cycle. And so this is a contradiction because we assumed at the top that G was a graph that was acyclic. And so that means that our assumption that there were two different paths is a contradictory or a false assumption. So we can conclude that there has to be a unique path between B and W. And then there's one important follow-up note to finish this part of the proof, which is that we chose V and W at random. We didn't make any extra assumptions. So this has to be true for every pair of vertices in G not just this random pair V and W that we happened upon. That's a really common tool in mathematical proof. Let's take a look at the second part, which is going to feel a lot like the first part. So now we're going to start with a graph that has a unique path between every pair of vertices, and we need to argue that it has to be connected and acyclic. So first, let's take a look at connected. So we know that there's a unique path between every pair of vertices. And our definition of connected is just that there is a path between every pair of vertices. We never assumed it's unique. So this is a definition that's strictly weaker than what we've assumed, which means that once we assume there's a unique path, there has to be a path in general. So that means that G is connected. For the acyclic part, we're going to use a similar argument by contradiction, which is my favorite kind of proof. A lot of mathematicians say, don't do a proof by contradiction if you can prove something directly but I always like to include proofs by contradiction. It's a fun twist of logic. So we'll say, in order to prove that G doesn't have any cycles, that it's acyclic, we'll assume that G did have a cycle. And so now in our, in our imaginary cycle, we'll choose two vertices, V and W, that happen to be on that cycle. So to get from V to W, we could go up and around the top of the cycle or down and around the bottom of the cycle. Or if you imagine starting on V, we could either walk clockwise or counterclockwise around to get to W. And so that means that there's two different ways to get from V to W or two paths between V and W, which is a contradiction because we assumed that there was a unique path between V and W. So that means that our assumption that G has a cycle has to be false, and we can conclude that G is acyclic. So that means that we finished proving part two which was the entirety of our theorem. So we'll include a little white box in the bottom corner. And that started in the 1950s as a symbol to say, we've absolutely positively finished our proof, hooray. So taking a look back, what we did is we proved that our two definitions for trees both characterize this, map, this network construct, which is that a graph is going to be connected and acyclic. It's a tree by this definition, if and only if there's a unique path between every pair of vertices a tree by that definition. And so this is a really standard result when you're starting to study trees. There's actually a third important way to characterize trees that we can use, which is that a graph is a tree, again, if it's connected, and if we count and the graph has one fewer edge than it has vertices. So let's take a look at this tree here. There's eight vertices, eight black dots, but only seven gray edges. So it has one fewer edge than it does vertices. And this is actually the minimum possible number of edges that you can have while still being a connected graph. You can imagine a little bit building it up. Once we start with one edge with two vertices, every time we add on another edge to our graph, or another vertex to our graph, we have to add on at least one edge. And we can never end up making a cycle because a cycle has the same number of vertices as edges. That's a little bit how the proof goes for proving that this characterization of trees is the same as our, as our earlier two. So each characterization is important for different reasons. If you're really good at spotting cycles and graphs, you'll like the connected and acyclic. If your mathematical work or your network analysis work is all about finding paths through graphs, then you'll care a lot about knowing when there's a unique path. This third definition is most useful for computer scientists or anybody who's asking a computer to check if a graph is a tree, because it's really easy to count the number of vertices and the number of edges in a graph. That goes a lot faster than looking for anything else. So knowing that it, we can define it by the count is really important here. Another question to take away, something that's a little bit harder to answer outside the scope of this talk, is, doing a, is asking how many trees there are on n vertices. So graph theory in theoretical mathematics is a subset of a field called combinatorics, which is all about counting. It's all about asking how many are there. 
how many ways are there to put something in order or rearrange them, et cetera. And so asking how many trees there are that have n vertices for some arbitrary number n is a really useful question to be asking. Oh, hi, Rebecca. So we have a question for this slide. Um, so the question is, how do you know that any path can be reversed? That's a great question. So what we're doing is we're working with undirected graphs, which means that each edge is equally between the two vertices. And so I'm talking about a path between any two vertices. It's also possible to study directed graphs where edges have a direction. And so we have a path from V to W. But here, any path is operating equally between V and W rather than going in any one direction. So just going back and forth along the same edges isn't a different path. It's still the same path. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I want to end by talking a little bit about my research. So as a graph theorist, I work with several families of graphs, not just trees, in a field called structural or extremal graph theory. And the kind of tree graphs were first defined in the 1850s and are pretty well studied. But the types of graphs that I'm looking at are emerging, were first, the properties were first characterized in the 1970s. And there's still, a, there's still a field of research that has lots of papers that come out each year. And in structural graph theory, the sorts of questions that I ask all the time are counting how many graphs have a given property and how else we can characterize graphs with that property. Once I have one definition, can I prove it's equivalent to another definition or another definition? And two of the main tools that I work with are vertex degrees or counting how many other vertices a given vertex is adjacent to as well as forbidden subgraph characterizations, which are a way of analyzing what a graph doesn't have. So just like we were able to define trees as graphs that don't have cycles, there's a number of other kinds of graph families that you can define by what the graph can't contain. And those are some of my favorites to work with. So I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Um, I guess while we're waiting for more questions, um, one that I have in mind um, relates to the uh, graph that you showed where you had these four vertices connected, but then one in the middle that wasn't connected. I was just mm -hmm. curious, like, if there's a real world, like, thing that, you know, that graph would apply to. Yeah, so... You can pretty trivially, which is to say in a not deep way, come up with a real world model for just about any graph. So my favorite go-to for envisioning graphs is to envision them as collections of people who know one another. So we could talk about this middle vertex as somebody who doesn't know any of the other four people and that those people, there's two people who know one another, those are our top two vertices, and then they each separately know a third person. So maybe this looks like, I don't know, maybe this looks like a married couple as our two top vertices, and then they each have one separate friend. And then there's a fifth random person who's also in the grocery store at the same time who doesn't know any of them. And you can come up with that kind of social model for any of your graphs and expect it to show up. Okay. And that, it, is a, it is a really common question in graph theory though, to be asking, given a particular situation, what types of graphs can model this situation? Mm, okay. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I didn't think that something like that would be considered a graph. So, okay. And now we have a few questions that rolled in. Um, so one of them is actually about, can you share more about your math group for middle school girls? Yeah. So Girls Angle Math Club is based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but they actually have a magazine that can go anywhere in the country. So I definitely recommend looking into that. We meet each week and there's about 30 girls and 10 or so mentors. And so we're talking in small groups and it's very much girl-led mathematical enrichment and research. So they'll come up with questions about things that are really interesting to them. So last semester, for instance, I was working with a group of eighth graders who really wanted to figure out how to analyze a game. And so they came up with their own mathematical game, two players that are, that are vying for different vertices on a graph. Who can color in all of the vertices and edges of the graph first, the red or the blue? And they follow the paths through the graph. And then once they run out of, once they can't make a move, move if their path is blocked, 
they lose. So they spent the semester drawing all sorts of graphs, analyzing which graphs red could win on, which graphs blue could win on, what was the optimal strategy. You can actually make a decision tree to show what each player should do on each turn, and then ended up writing up their theorem and giving a proof for which player has a winning strategy on various different types of graphs. So that's a project that I helped mentor. It's not yet publishable research, but they're only in eighth grade. By the time they get to 10th or 12th grade, they might be doing something that's a more significant publishable result. So there's girls there from sixth through 12th grade, and it's really fun to get to work with them and hear all of their ideas. Wow, yeah, thank you so much for sharing about that. That sounds really cool. Um, so another question that we have are, what are the applications for graph research? So all of this is happening within graph research. So anybody who wants to prove more modern questions about trees is going to absolutely need to know all of the different definitions for trees and connect back and forth to them. Otherwise, sometimes people are able to prove results that apply to categories of graphs in general, rather than a specific kind of graph or about how we can, how we can do different operations on a graph like different ways of combining graphs or separating graphs. Those are really common questions to be asking in graph theory. Okay, um, and another question is, can many different phenomena share identical map geometry? Are any phenomena unique in how they map? That's a, I love that question. And yes, many different phenomena can share an identical map geometry. I think, a, I think a really good example of that might be Kirsten's, her first species tree that had geckos and chimpanzees and some other kinds of species also. I was just excited about the geckos, so I remember them. My guess is that that species tree is also the species tree. If we erased the labels and chose different animals, that species tree would work exactly the same for a whole different class and a whole different other set. And you can also use it to model all sorts of other things. I don't think we could ever come up with a graph that only models one thing, just because you can always you can always build a house that has a really crazy floor plan, or maybe it has to be a four dimensional house to get it to work. And you can always come up with some kind of social network of who knows whom that's just a total mess to navigate. So it's you can sort of always come up with these arbitrary situations that a graph can model. Okay, great. And as just a follow up. Um, to the person who asked about the uh, program for the middle school girls. Um, so John mentions that their day job is in search and the first trick in relevance is deciding what not to search. So I can see the application of saying what a graph is not. Oh, yeah. sorry, that might have been, yeah, that might have been not related to that question. But yeah. yeah, no, but this is actually, graph theory is hugely relevant to computer science. So the field started with a mathematician named Euler in Germany or in Prussia in the, seven, in the late 1600s, but it really trickled along and didn't get a lot of attention until the 1950s and the 1960s with the advent of computer science. And once computer scientists started looking at networks and looking at larger and larger networks, graph theory suddenly ballooned into a field of huge mathematical importance that really stands alone aside from its connections to computer science. So, so much of what happens in data structures and algorithms in computer science ties very closely to how graph theory works and the fields, the fields stand alone, but also trade information and results back and forth pretty significantly. So my work isn't related to computer science at all, but what comes out is often very useful. Yeah, yeah, that's really good um, context and framework to know about how they're related. Um, so we do have a couple more questions. Um, so what are some examples of ways to define trees based on characteristics they don't have? Right, so the main definition for trees that we've been using is exactly that. So saying that a tree is a graph that's connected and acyclic. So here acyclic means it has no cycles. So it doesn't have a triangle, doesn't have a square, doesn't have a pentagon doesn't have a hexagon and so on. And so those, those formally are basic types of graphs that are really important to keep track of in graph theory. And we call those cycles a three cycle with three vertices, a four cycle with four vertices. And this slide graph two is the sixth cycle. It's exactly six vertices in a cycle. And we can define a tree as a graph that has none of those as subgraphs. So a subgraph here is just like a subpart. If you zoom in, it's just one section of your graph. 
And so if no section of your graph is any kind of cycle, then your graph is acyclic. So exactly what we're doing here is defining a tree by what it isn't. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Um, and then it looks like the final question might be, um, can, I guess, graphs or trees help with the traveling salesman problem? And if you could also provide a little context on what the traveling salesman problem is for people who might know, not know, such as myself. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. So the traveling salesman problem is an intractable problem in computer science that asks us to figure out if a salesman needs to visit a bunch of cities, or maybe it's somebody with packages to deliver needs to visit a bunch of cities, some of which are closer together, some of which are further apart based on the geometry of whatever place you're in, what's the most expedient what's the most expedient route for them to go from city to city like for instance if i need to drop something off in san francisco san jose and redwood city it might make sense for me to go down the coast or it might make sense for me to go up once i start adding in a lot of places that are in weird orders then it's not always immediately clear what order i should go in so this is a really important problem for any sort of package delivery service the ish end it's really easy to model with what's called a weighted graph we put a dot at every place we need to go, and then we put edges between every two places. But what we can do is we can weight them. So we'll assign a numerical value to each edge, which is the distance that between those two places. And so that means that some edges take longer to travel and some edges take less time based on whatever the weight is. The traveling salesman problem then is to find the shortest path that goes to all the vertices of the graph, where shortest here is defined by the sum of the edges or taking the least travel time. I wish I had a picture to help illustrate. The issue with the traveling salesman problem, so the traveling salesman problem is totally modelable by a graph. So that's the graph theory answer. As a side note for people who aren't familiar with the problem, the issue with it is that it's something called NP complete which is to say that computers can't solve it in any sort of reasonable time frame, like before the heat death of the universe is what I'm defining as reasonable here. So if the problem, if the problem is more than a very small section, it becomes very quickly intractable to do by any kind of algorithm. So obviously for like five, they can, but like to solve the problem in general for an arbitrary situation is not really possible. Okay, wow. So I guess then for the trap. So, okay, right. So like you mentioned, the traveling salesman problem is only solvable if you look at only a few points at a time, basically. Basically. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a really good way of putting it. All right. So yeah, this, is, this is an excellent example of how a computer science problem can be modeled in graph theory. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. See it all connecting together. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, and so we have another one more question, um, might be our final one of the night, um, where they ask, are edges on trees allowed to bend? Um, do mathematicians ever deal with trees where edges can bend? Yes, yeah, so in graph theory, edges can bend all they want. And that leads to a really common question for graph theorists, which is asking if a graph is something we can draw where none of the edges overlap or not. So for instance, in graph one, the edges are currently overlapping, but we could just move them any which way we want to. An edge is only a relationship between the two points. It's not defining anything about the space it goes through. So yes, they can bend, they can bend lots. And it's common to ask questions about how they bend and overlap, knowing that they're not really anything more than that kind of relationship. Okay, cool. Um, and there was one more question that appeared, so I will say this will be the final one um, for tonight. Um, so for Martin, how does Google Maps find the shortest route? Um, Martin, that's a question beyond my pay grade. I'm not really sure how Google Maps does it. My guess is that they are optimizing, i.e. hope is i.e. it's the shortest within reason, rather than saying this is absolutely possibly the shortest. They also have a lot of other complicated factors like traffic and stuff. So I'm not exactly sure how it works. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca, for answering all of our questions. Um, great talk. Thank you.
these have been just two really great talks tonight. And um, I loved how they worked so well together with um, data visualization and data points. And it's just been really, really neat and just some really great imagery tonight too. So thank you so much. Um, thank you speakers. Uh, thanks to those who asked questions to tune in. Um, next month's science bubble is on the third Tuesday of the month at 530. So that is going to be um, February 15th. Um, please be sure um, to tune in and sign up and um, pass along the word. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.